the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for giving us the opportunity to gather together in faith uh, and to explore the history of the church uh, and the, the works of the Holy Spirit through our study of Acts of the Apostles. Help us to make connections in our own heart and in our own faith community where we are not measuring up, or, or perhaps you're challenging us to grow and respond in, in a new, bolder way. And we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, woman. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, and now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, today, my intent is that we study both chapter 6 and 7 together because that will kind of close the loop on the story of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, the first martyr of the church. But before we do that, uh, I try each week for a quick recap and to see if there are any lingering questions from last time. So, uh, last time we gathered, we we uh, spoke about chapter 5. There was the strange story of Ananias and Sapphira, this married couple who withheld some of their financial stewardship and thusly they were both struck dead. Uh, and we, we saw an example in the aftermath of that of papal church discipline and how that was treated. But uh, there's, there's a lesson to be to be had about not withholding our gifts from God and from the church, just in general, that gifts given to us are meant to be shared. I think that's the lesson we can take away. There's not any gift that God has given you that's meant for you to keep to yourself. Whether it's talents, whether it's material resources, whether it's time, whatever, uh, it's for the building up of the body of Christ uh, for our whole community. So you, you just see... The focal point is the life of the community it takes precedent over individual needs in that first part of the story. Then I try to highlight from verse 12 onward that there seems to be an evolutionary change happening. The apostles are in some ways being separated from the Christians as a whole. Not in a negative way, but in the sense that, wow, they're so close to God, they are almost superhuman, they are doing miraculous things, and the Christian community, much, much like I described the community around Moses, they're sort of giving the apostles space. The apostles are setting up shop at Solomon's portico, and everybody else is in awe of them, but they are not joining them. And I think the suggestion is they, you know, they're so full of the Holy Spirit and so full of God's grace that they, they seem otherworldly in, in a way that is makes people kind of stand back. That is so different from the end of John's Gospel. I try to contrast it with that, where you see the apostles still have doubts and questions and stuff. Now they, they're like, really like other Christs. We say in the Catechism, each one of us, we are called to be an ultra Christus in the world. We're, we're meant to shine the light of Christ for people to see um, they're doing that, and they're so seemingly so close to the example that Christ set that people are just stunned by it. Um, and last of all, we, we touched on just how often the apostles are being arrested with the kind of regularity. Uh, and ultimately, we, we ended by talking about the testimony of Gamaliel, who was St. Paul's teacher, and who's, who advised, we need to leave these guys alone because if what they're doing is man-made, it will die on its own. It will not survive the test of time. But if it's of God and you set yourself against them, you're actually going to war against God, which is not a good idea. You're going to lose. Um, and I suggested, uh, by the way, a book for anybody interested in that line of thinking. It's, it was called Hostile Witnesses. It was a uh, series of quotes and writings and testimonials from antichrists, really, um, dictators and horrible people who set as a goal the, the destruction 
of Christianity and how they have disappeared in history. Most of their names are not even recognizable. And here we still are, 2,000 years later. So according to Gamaliel, if you ever have doubts about the church, sometimes you look at the bureaucracy or the administrative structure of the church, and you may ask yourself, where is God in all this? Well, sometimes we do a good job of disguising God with our bumblings, but I would argue, uh, see God's presence in the fact that we are still here. After 2,000 years, we have stood the test of time. That should give us confidence. We see other churches fracture, fracture, fracture. When there's a disagreement, when there's an argument, there's a breakup. Um, we have to figure out how to argue with each other and stay together. And so at the end of the day, it's kind of the idea of I get in arguments with my siblings, but at the end of the day, we're still family. And that's kind of our church, I think. We have, we have a lot of different sectors, but we're, we're called to be one. That is where we ended on chapter 5. Were there any lingering questions from chapter 5 or before, or just comments that people wanted to share before we launch into chapter 6? We're good? So I either, I either gave a very thorough explanation, or we've all forgotten what it was. Thank you, prophets. Okay. So let's turn to chapter 6. Uh, one thing I would point out here as we're reading chapter 6, in my opinion, this is an example of the second administrative challenge the church faces. To me, the first challenge is what to do about Judas Iscariot absence. And it was a very important thing. It wasn't just to, oh, Judas messed up our reputation, uh, or we like 12, it's a good round number, and you better get somebody else. No. It was a mechanism they came up with to make sure the church will live on and live on and live on. That's, that's a very important precedent. That, to me, is the first administrative obstacle uh, that we now have established apostolic succession. When a bishop passes away or retires or whatever, we name him a bishop. An example today, I just heard from the door, my favorite bishop in America, Bishop Robert Ferentz, is apparently now no longer auxiliary bishop in Los Angeles. He's going somewhere in Minnesota. And he will be bishop there. So I have to read up on this afternoon and see where he's going. But that's the nature of our church. And the best example, if you ever go on a pilgrimage, you will have, you should slap yourself if you don't go visit St. Paul outside the Wall Basilica. You cannot go to Rome and not go to that place. And the, they, in Rome, they, they list seven principal basilicas that you really must see. That's one of them. That's where the tomb of St. Paul is, uh, where he was beheaded. And it has the famous mosaics along the upper wall, picture of every pope in an unbroken chain, starting with Peter all the way up to Pope Francis right now. There's nothing more visual that gets the point across to me of apostolic succession in that building. I just, every time I see it, I'm in awe. Um, you could probably pull that image up online too, in the great age of the internet. They have these kind of remote cameras in some of these facilities. You can swing the camera around and look at the building as though you were in it. And you can probably see some of those amazing images. Okay, so this is the second administrative decision. To me, I would call it division of labor. Uh, we say that in the sacrament of holy orders there are three expressions of holy orders. The fullest expression resides in the bishop. Because we can say the bishop is at the rank of apostle. They're modern day apostles. Uh, priest is in the intermediate rank and then in this chapter we add the office of deacon. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, I would just add this. So, I know it's confusing to some people, but every bishop is also a deacon. Every priest is also a deacon. And then there are deacons who are deacons. We all share in that office. It's not something we spur because we, we talk about the office of deacon as the office of service. Um, before I could be ordained a priest, part of Canon law, part of our tradition requires that I first be ordained a deacon. And 
normally you have to serve for a canonical year. A year and a day, I think, is the, the normal rule, unless you get a special dispensation from the bishop. Um, I share with Deacon Dennis and Deacon Ron that I was a deacon for almost two years. In a weird phenomenon, I was the first one in my class to be ordained, but I was the last one to be ordained priest. So it just it worked out in the scheduling. Um, and uh, in my case, because it's a step toward the next thing, we refer to that kind of diaconate as transitional deacon. I'm going to transition from deacon to priest eventually, but it's a required step. Um, others are ordained deacon, and that is the, their final destination. We call them permanent deacons. Um, we presently have two permanent deacons in our parish, Deacon Ron Villardi and Deacon Dennis Macy. Um, permanent deacons may be married if they're married before they're ordained. And normally, if their spouse passes away, they're not permitted to be remarried, uh, unless some special permission. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis, some priests can be married too. We have Protestant ministers who convert to Catholicism, and by a special dispensation from the Pope, they can be dispensed from celibacy. But it's a case-by-case -case basis; it will never be a universal change. Anyway, so I, uh, when I was ordained a priest, my diaconate didn't disappear. It's you could say my priesthood was added onto it, and so it's a kind of a reminder that each priest called to service first. But this is the the birth the birthday story of the diaconate. It starts out of conflict. So did I explain it okay in the diaconate? This is just as another question that comes up because of the subject that I have seen before where somebody is named a cardinal priest. Oh gosh. Yeah. Uh, or a cardinal deacon. I don't know the answer to that. Um, the question is Titles around the card. There, there are various ranks of cardinals. I don't know all the honorifics of that. Um, all I know is a joke. It's a, a cardinal is not part of holy orders, so you know it's an administrative title. It is more analogous to monsignor. And uh, some of you know Father Joseph Becher. He used to be pastor at Ashland. He's now rector of Monte Seminary. He, he's the first one who was. I don't think he originated this joke, it's probably more joke, but in our guys, he started telling everyone, uh, what's the difference between a Monsignor and a priest? The answer is, nothing but don't tell the Monsignor. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of instructive joke. And, uh, you're not adding to their holy orders, they're still a priest. It's sort of a lifetime achievement award. And in our diocese, Arch Archbishop Blasney would not name one seniors. He had a policy. He said, um, well, if I name one in some way, that might be discouraging another priest, so I'm just not going to do it. Then he took a trip to the Vatican, and he was asked, and every three years, bishops must go to Rome. And he was asked, why do you have no monsignors in your diocese? You need to address this. You won't fix this or whatever. So he came back, and he said, okay, then. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to go big. So he named like 14 or 16 or 18. One shot. And uh, it, it, it means to be a cardinal or a monsignor usually comes with red piping in your vestments. Uh, if you see the color scarlet or red, it means essentially you're an honorary member of the Pope's household. You're just given a special honorific status recognizing contribution to the church. But it's not part of holy orders, just to keep that clear, those things aside. The cardinals really have one function to vote for a pope. And you can't be voted as a pope unless you're a cardinal. So to become a candidate for a pope, you must first be named cardinal. But that's really their only function. They meet at the death of a pope, or in a more recent case, retirement from a pope, um, to choose the next pope. Okay. But up until now, all we had, you know, this is an emerging structure. Um, we had apostles. They were the authority to all questions. But now, as the gospel is starting to spread places, um, we're told, especially from St. Paul in his language, he says he establishes elders to look over each place because he does not view his vocation as administrative. You know, I'm not a nester. I, I start fires. 
I set a spark. I started a new community then. Uh, after some prayer, probably some discernment, some charismatic prayer, they, at the recommendation of the community, some elders are recommended. The term that's used in scriptures, presbyters, which is uh, a word that we use for the priesthood still today. So essentially, the apostle acting as bishop is ordained priest to look after locations. But now we see a new need emerging. So we're just going to read a portion of this and, and talk about have your Bible read along with me. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists murmured against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the body of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up, up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, pick out from among yourselves seven men of good repute Full of the spirit of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands upon them. Notice, it's a description. They pray and they lay hands on them. These are the actions of the sacrament of ordination, the holy orders. So clearly they're being ordained here. And the Greek word being used to describe them is diakonoi. That's where the word comes from, deacon. So there's a lot of things to comment on here, but... I'll just kind of go for the things I noted in my note. First of all, we don't know the, the, the nature of this inequity between the Hellenized Hebrews and the other Hebrews. We don't exactly know what it is. We're, we know some people are being neglected in ministry. And so someone needs to see to it. But I wrote down three possibilities of why this neglect might be happening. One could be language barrier. Honestly, it could be as simple as that. Um, the Hellenized Jews preferred to speak Greek. They didn't necessarily know Hebrew. Um, this is a challenge every priest face, faces, even despite our best wishes. For instance, here, when I arrived here, our parish was about 40% Hispanic, and it's fluctuated, but it's, it's creeping towards 60% Hispanic. And I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker. And I have to rely on a parochial vicar who speaks Spanish and our Mexican sister sometimes to bring to me concerns, things being neglected. But it could happen, even with my best intention, that our Hispanic community is being neglected because I don't know every aspect of the Hispanic culture. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to improve my language ability. But it could be as simple as that. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, I just came out of a meeting where we identify that one of the three priorities we need to work on here in our parish is prioritizing our Hispanic community. Why? Because we just had confirmation. I think there were 88 people confirmed, 100% Hispanic. Well, I think of that. There were four or five Anglo kids. Four or five. Basically, Hispanic. Our youth group is 95% at least Hispanic. Um, the baptisms we do here, we probably do 20 Spanish baptisms for every one English baptism. You can see where all the growth is. So if I'm wise as a minister, I need to make sure I don't neglect that. But I, I require teamwork, I require support to be made aware when that's the case. That could be it. Here's another possibility. Um, when, when you hear the word Hellenized, first of all, just so you know what that is, it dates back to the influence of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, in some ways, was very progressive, very liberal. He wanted to conquer the whole world. He, he took a different approach than the Roman military. The Romans spoke of, of uh, Pax Romana. I've talked with you about this before. Peace through force. You know, carry the big stick. There are still politicians today who think that's a way to peace. Have more nuclear bombs than some other country or whatever. Um, 
that uh, that idea of uh, I forgot my point. I forgot my train of thought there. It just happened. Anyway, okay, Alexander the Great. Back to him. So he didn't want to take that approach. He didn't want to coerce people. He actually, out of national pride, he believed that Macedonia and Greece, he was actually from Macedonia, but they had the Greek culture. He believed the Greek culture was so superior that other people would just naturally be attracted to it. So he said, I require only one thing from the people I conquer, and you will learn fluent Greek, or you'll die. I mean, he killed people who didn't learn Greek on punishment of death or torture or whatever. So high motivation to learn Greek. He said, through a common language, it will unify the empire, and you will all be taught Greek philosophy, and I think because the truth is indisputable, you'll be attracted to it, and you'll want to be like us Greeks. The, the people in the Middle East who most enthusiastically adopted that approach, we refer to them as Hellenized Jews. For instance, they participated in the Olympics. They had gymnasiums where they went to exercise in the Greek manner. They studied Greek philosophy. They preferred Greek language. They had at least a sort of a user-friendly Greek name added on to their Jewish name. Um, you can even see that in some of the apostles. They actually, the names are given are Greek rather than uh, Jewish. Uh, but it's, but uh, some, you know, if, if those Hellenized folks, it's not clear in the text, if they were Jewish in origin and Hellenized, the Palestinian Jews disliked them very much. They kind of, they were only like a baby step away from Samaritans in their mind to say, you know, you, you're not staying true to our culture, our God, you're, you're toying with paganism, and they, they worship a, a pluralism of gods, and you're kind of just like half Jews. You're not enthusiastically Jewish, and there was hard feelings between these groups. So it could be a surviving kind of sense of discrimination toward people who had questionable theological roots, you know, if you will, or cultural roots. And, and the third possibility is these Hellenized people perhaps were not Jewish. Maybe we're already talking about some Gentile converts, and you know from the first council of the church, we're still wrestling with the idea of what to do with Gentile converts. Should they become Jews first, and then Christian, or what? So, there are a number of possible explanations, but clearly, they're not being treated in the same way. Some are getting favoritism over others, and uh, the apostles at least are doing the kind of work that needs to be done as we need them. Uh, but it's kind of, it makes me laugh because they, they're trying to describe what they think is the apostles' job, which is to pray and preach and teach. But right out of the gate, we see the first example of the deacon, he's preaching and teaching and praying. He's not doing anything with what they just described. So it's a head scratcher. But it's also why today you, you see the balance of our, our deacons preach and teach. But also our archbishop says if you want to be a deacon in our diocese, you need an apostolic work. Otherwise, I won't ordain you. So Deacon Dennis, for instance, is chaplain for all, all the fire department in the county. And he's also chaplain at uh, Asante Hospital. Uh, deacon Ron Filardi teaches baptism classes, and he does all the English baptisms. So they each have an apostolic work besides preaching and teaching. Okay, does that make sense to people? So, it's sad, but, you know, on some level we have to say we're, we never were free of scandal. Uh, we never were, as, as in the words of one of my deacon professors in seminary, you know, he's a deacon, but one of the most knowledgeable scripture scholars I know in America, and he said there never was a golden age. Say it a thousand times to yourself. There never was a golden age. There never was a golden age. Anybody who thinks if I just go back in the time machine and I'll, I'll find a church that's perfect and doesn't have any sinners and no flaws, it doesn't exist. Never was. Never. Never happened and it's not happening today either. We got our own flaws today. Um, but ultimately, these seven were named. Okay? 
Uh, what else can we say about this good play? Um, question, we had a, a, a seminarian in the area who was required, I think, or wanted to speak Spanish. Was he told to do that, or is that his own decision? You talking about James? Yes, sir. Um, he's on what's called a pastoral year, and uh, pastoral year is something in our modern church, you know, normal. In most fields, you can get a master's degree in two years, probably. In seminary, it takes five years, because most seminaries will say four years of theological study, and after the second year, right in the middle, they're required to go serve in the church for a year. And the reason is because some people are good at academics, and they like school, but they don't like people. <laughs> That's a problem. It's a problem to be blunt. The way you like to say it is, do you have a pastoral heart? We, we don't need necessarily. It's nice if priests know their faith and know the teaching of the church. I would say that's a requirement. But if you're just a cerebral, scholarly person, it doesn't necessarily mean to be a good pastor or capable of pastoral care. So they put them in a setting and serving, and normally it's a chance to get various certifications or, or advanced training if you need it. So language study might be a thing, uh, training in any prison setting, out of, out of ministry in jails, or how to minister in hospitals. He's getting certified through the hospital system too. Um, so he's checking off a list of goals probably he's identified um, that he needs. Some people will in pastoral you need to study English because they're international seminaries. Um, but when he comes back, he will be in his diaconate year. So after this year's done, he goes back at the end of next school year for him, he will be ordained a deacon if he's still on track. And so for those who don't Was mm. You know, the, the implication here is that all seven of these Chosen people are from the Hellenized sector. It's like we need we need people from that neglected group to serve that group. So I'm going to say yes. That will be my guess. Good question. I just uh, the permanent diaconate was gone for some time. When was this restored? Yeah. Okay. Here's a historian right here. Um, <laughs> there was a time. I don't want to overcomplicate things, but I'll give you a simple overarching tour of history, there, there reached a point that the inter interpretation of the story was this, and it's a really bad oversimplification in my opinion, that priest and bishop's job is to oversee the spiritual needs of the church, and a deacon is dealing with the material needs of the church, because here it talks about distributing food and stuff. It sounds like very earthly concerns, very administrative day-to-day um, -day operations. That evolved over time to, to be that the deacon became the bursar of a diocese. They would be the one to oversee all management of money because that's that's not heavenly spiritual thing. That's, a, that's an earthly thing. So, for instance, uh, if you look up sometime all of the canonized deacons of the church, the vast majority of them were killed because they were the bursar. For instance, St. Lawrence, uh, for, for whatever reason, I guess after this scriptural model, um, in Rome, along with the Pope, they had named seven archdeacons. That became a tradition to keep the number seven. And the, the head the deacon oversaw the finances of the entire global church. And Lawrence, you know, when, when the barbarians raided Rome, they killed the Pope. Died a martyr, and then they captured Lawrence, understanding he knows where the treasure is. And uh, while he was in prison, he got word out, he instructed the brethren to distribute all the funds of the church to the poor so that it didn't exist anymore. And they gave him a number of days to produce the treasure. They said that we're already tortured under pain of death. And he, he got word out that all of the poor of the city of Rome should come in front of where he was on the day was to give an answer. And when they asked him where is the treasure of the church, he said, look out the window. That's the treasure of the church. Um, the poor of our community. And so they fried him over a grill. 
Oh. He's the one who said, uh, I guess jokingly, flip me over, I'm done on this side. <laughs> I mean, he's burned to death. Guy Martin. Um, other, other deacons were similar. But it, it got to be a power tug of war. So, I mean, the church is made up of sinners. Uh, the tug of war became, the deacons became too powerful. They controlled all of the finances, all of the, they had all the political power, all the earthly power. And so for a time they were suppressed. Um, and then they were brought back to the Vatican II Council. So um, what we have today is a, re, a restoration of the first century. That's a fascinating story too. It's kind of on parallel with reading about the suppression of the Jesuits. You know, there was a time when the head of the Jesuit order was seen to be like second in command of the church. They called him the Black Pope because they wore black robes. Um, the deacons had journeys and went that. But we found a happy balance again. <laughs> and the and the way we uh, the way we keep it in the right perspective is, as I said, we're all called to service. So. Um, I am a priest, but I'm also, I still retain that part of the Holy Orders I receive as a deacon. Um, so we are all called to serve, to be servant leaders. That's ultimately it. And it shouldn't be about power ever. If it's about power, we're doing it wrong. Okay. What's another thing to point out here? I, I talked with a few of you about this, but when you go over the list of the, the deacons, um, it turns out that the deacons also have a Judas Iscariot. I, I think this is worth knowing because, again, there never was a golden age. Uh, we've never been free of scandal. But this last fellow who was named, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, later became a heretic. And he, he started a movement called the Nicolaitans. It was named after him. He didn't probably call it that, but... You know, when you're a heretic, a moment to stand up for you, it's not a good sign. <laughs> if you no longer have the name Christian after Christ, that you probably derailed somewhere. Um, but it's actually mentioned twice by John in his writings. Um, and I think I have even in my footnotes it mentioned, but one is in Revelation. In Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 6. Verses 15. So the letters to the seven churches. I'll read this to you. Just so you know I'm not making it up. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. And Revelation opens with a circular letter that John, the bishop there, is writing to the seven churches of Ephesus. Uh, and if you look up Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. This is him writing to Ephesus. It says this, but you have this in your favor. It, he criticizes them for things they're doing wrong, but at the end he closes with this thing. But you have this in your favor. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So, there it is mentioned. And it also comes up again in verse 15 of the same chapter. This is now his letter to Pergamon. Uh, Writes, likewise, you also have some people who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans, therefore repent, otherwise I will come to you quickly and wage war against them with the sword of my mouth. Um, here's what is strange about this. We don't exactly know what the Nicolaitans believed in. I tried to research this. It's fairly vague, but there are two elements, it seems, that the church historians agree upon. Um, they they had a misinterpretation about sins of the flesh, if you will. Um, this later became a kind of a characteristic of Gnosticism, a, a false division. People who were Gnostics had this idea that um, Satan is equal and opposite God to our God, and that his realm is the material realm. So things that are physical are evil of their nature, but they made this great leap to think that ultimately to be a human being is just, we're just a soul. We're, we're prisoners of this body, this body, ooh, icky, it's sinful. Um, my goal in death is to escape this prison. And they, therefore, they didn't believe in the incarnation. 
God was spirit. That's good. Why would he take on our ickiness and enter into the material world? And therefore, they also didn't believe in sacraments because sacraments use material things like water and oil and bread and wine. Um, it seems like the Nicolaitans were an early version of that because one of the connotations of people who thought that way is uh, you could either become an extreme, you know, enter into a extreme asceticism to starve yourself to death and whip yourself and torture yourself and say, I have to overcome all these temptations of the flesh because my whole body is evil and everything is evil. And those people who took that stance died out because they didn't sell their life and they didn't have children. Or the other extreme, which also existed, was I can become a hedonist since my body is not really me. It doesn't matter what I do with it. So having sexual orgies and other things of that life, it just sought pleasure. And they said, I'm not, not accountable for it because material things can only do evil anyway, and it's not really me. It's my prison doing it, and I'll escape from it. Um, so what we think of the Nicolaitans is that they, they had sexual promiscuity incorporated as a part of their worship. And secondly, um, they totally rejected the guideline about eating foods sacrificed to pagan gods. They just said, I don't see a problem with it. Let's partake. And so there's a blending of uh, idol worship and sexual immorality anyway. And it became popular because, that, you know, if you're a salesman, that's a pretty good sales pitch. Join us and do whatever you want. No consequence. Uh, so this is why John hated them. Uh, but to me, the value is to remind us there will always be a Judas this year. And sadly, in our own clergy scandal after 2000, uh, it's the plague of our time. But there never has been a time. It's kind of taking turns between the laity and the clergy being the source of scandal. But we've always battled with interior scandal, unfortunately. Um, so the point is, don't be scandalized. Um, my, my life coach, St. Teresa of Avila, said in one of her writings, we should never be scandalized by the sin or evil that people commit. We should be shocked that they're capable of doing any good at all. So she preferred to lean on the side of, wow, we just did something amazing. You just did something Christ-like. And whenever the opposite happens, she'd say, yeah, we're sinners. So... Uh, I guess you, you figure out your own way to navigate through those <laughs> terrible stories. Is that pretty clear for people? So Nicholas got the red card. <laughs> but ultimately we have, a, we have a, a, a system in place to replace it with other deacons, etc., etc. Okay. What else can we say about that section? Any, any words or phrases or other detail about that part I read? Stand up to you. Are you referring to uh, verse 7 as well? Because I have a question there. Okay. Verse 7 says, And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Uh, just read it now. The, the detail that jumps out there is priests. Uh, my footnotes say, and I checked, I cross referenced this with others that this was including in particular two groups. The Sadducees, because they're preaching at Solomon's portico, at the front door of the temple, the kind of priests who are going to be won over are the Sadducees, they're to the temple officials. Pharisees, I don't think, would identify themselves as priests. They were more street preachers. They were like lay preachers. Um, so the Sadducees, but also possibly included in that were the Essenes. Essenes were holding out the Essenes of the four groups, Sadducees, Pharisees, Essenes, and Zealots, the, the Essenes were best positioned, I think, in my opinion, to accept Christianity because they believed that the current structure of Judaism was corrupt, that the priesthood was, had gone corrupt, and they were trying to live apart from them in the desert. Uh, they were the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance. They were going through purifying rituals, and they told themselves in their interior stories God will come and establish a purer covenant 
and we will no longer worship like hypocrites, but with pure hearts. And we want to be ready for the call. When he comes, we want to be ready. So, some of them, it's likely, would have identified Christianity as that prophecy being fulfilled. Anyway, large numbers. And your question or comment was what? Well, thank you for the definition on who was priest, but yeah. were they not still descendants of Levi? Yes, but uh, this is them, you could say, much like Barnabas, selling their birthright. You know, if they leave Judaism for this new movement, they're saying that structure's done. So Sadducees were Levites? Yeah, that's the tribe of Levi. Yes. And, so, the, and the Essenes, I never knew that. I thought. Yeah. Uh, we think it's commonly held thought that John the Baptist was in a scene or lived with the Essenes in the wilderness in the desert. Of that same spirit. Uh, the other group, it's not mentioned here, but it's mentioned in history. The other group where there were large numbers of converts were Roman soldiers, the military. And they make up one of the largest groups of martyrs because their interpretation back then of accepting the Christian faith was I must become a pacifist. Like, I can't kill anybody. Thou shalt not kill. So I can't be a soldier anymore. But in those days, your profession was not chosen by you. It's very different from what we have today. If your father was a soldier, you were a soldier. You inherited that work. And you were tattooed or branded on your arm to mark in case you ever defected or ran away. They, they could put you to death for, for leaving your duty. Um, and refusal to obey orders was taken extremely seriously by the Roman military that you know they can't tolerate any of that that's how they became so mighty so the refusal to obey a command was punishable by immediate execution and they cited the reason you're killing me is because I'm Christian um, so that's another group where there was a big uh, number of people come over you, you, you can think of uh, St. Sebastian since he was killed by archers, a pirate squad, or um, a later guy, it's a later time in history, but uh, who's, the, the, who's the same who divided his cloak and gave half to the poor man? St. Martin of Tours, another soldier. So uh, this kind of call of a valorous way of living that attracted them, uh, that required bravery and Virtue, kind of like the knights of the medieval time. Um, okay, did that answer your thought? Yes. Okay, so yes. I, I'm sorry, but I didn't hear a question. Uh, you. Who were the priests? <laughs> uh, she wanted to know who made up the priests, who were these converts, because it says specifically in verse 7 a large number of priests people. The priests referred to their Sadducees and Essenes, according to scholarly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <coughs> you wouldn't run into a lot of Pharisees on the temple grounds, other than they're represented in the Sanhedrin. Those guys would be out in the streets. So if you watch the chosen, they depicted both types. You know, the Sadducees, their office was the temple. Um, the Pharisees, they were wandering street preachers who had synagogues. They can come from any tribe, but Sadducees were pretty much exclusively Levites. All right, so we get to Stephen, and uh, it says that, you know, it, it describes in a number of ways Stephen's qualities, and I think it's important, I won't read it, but I encourage you to look back. Keep in mind, the author we're reading here, Luke, this style of writing that he uses here. He also employs in the start of his gospel. If you read the start of the gospel, Steve, uh, Luke goes back and forth between Jesus' birth and John the Baptist's birth. Mm -hmm. There's an annunciation for John the Baptist, there's an annunciation for Jesus. There's a birth of John, there's the birth of Jesus. And it goes back and forth. He intentionally is setting these two stories parallel to each other. So you see they're a matching pair, they go together. 
John the Baptist is the prophet announcing the arrival of Jesus. Here he's using a similar style, but obviously he's structuring or telling the story in such a way that the reader will immediately identify Jesus in his passion. The, the, Stephen is called in Greek the proto-martyr. He's the first one. But how many things are similar? First of all, he's full of grace and power. It's described that he's an innocent person, an innocent victim. Uh, he did great signs and wonders in the presence of the people like Jesus. Um, he was filled with the spirit and with wisdom. And he spoke in a ways that his opponents could not withstand. This is like Jesus being described as he, he speaks with an authority that the Pharisees don't have, that the temple officials don't have. Where does this authority come from? And, and he's described as having the face of an angel, innocent. And then if you follow into the next chapter, into chapter 7, um, false charges are brought against him. False witnesses, so it's a trumped up story, not true. Um, there's a Trinitarian image near the end, like, I mean, in Jesus' case, it's he turns to the Father and he says some words and then he gives him the Spirit. And you see the Trinity. In this case, it says, Stephen, filled with the Spirit, looks up to heaven and sees the Christ seated at the right hand of the Father. There's a Trinitarian image again. Um, ultimately, before he's killed, he, he asks God to forgive his offenders, essentially because they don't know what they're doing, like Jesus did. So, although he died in a different manner, being stones to death, um, those essential markers are the same. And it's kind of laying out a roadmap. If you're going to be a martyr for the faith, here's how you want to go. This is a perfect exit. Um, and also, he was led outside the city before he was killed. Jesus was led outside the city at the time, outside the city walls, to go with us to be crucified. Stephen is led outside the walls to be stoned to death. And uh, we learned of the place where we went to pilgr pilgrimage. It's in the north east side of the old city of Jerusalem. It happens to now be the Muslim quarter. So kind of weird, but if you're at the Lion's Gate, it's where it's at. That's where he was stoned to death. Um, and then he asked the Lord Jesus to receive his spirit. So uh, it's like the perfect faithful death. But to me, the most striking thing is right after saying the deacon's job is to serve food at, at the dinner table, he didn't do any of that. And neither does the next guy, by the way, if you go to chapter 8, Philip, that Philip that's being mentioned that we'll, we'll see you next time, is not Philip the apostle, it's Philip the deacon. And he's also out there preaching and teaching and praying. So, I'm a little confused about that reference. It, I think, I guess you could say the Holy Spirit has, has its own life to, you know, instructs us in the ways He will. Um, well, we'll just read from verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, arose in the spirit of Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council and a set of false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place in the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat at the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Um, in this case, I'm trying, honestly, because I'm sometimes I read in a cynical fashion. I'm a critical reader, I'll say. I'm actually, my first reaction was I'm trying to identify where's the false witness. What they're describing is actually true. He is advocating that the teachings of Moses be changed. He is advocating that this place, its purpose be altered. So, at least what they mentioned in those details is accurate. But 
I think the noteworthy thing here is maybe this. Uh, it says that these people who oppose Stephen are freedmen, uh, which I looked up, and you might see it in your footnotes if you have a certain kind of study Bible. We think the freedmen were formerly Jewish slaves who served in Europe, you know, who were serving the Roman Empire in that region, and who were once free, desired to return to Palestine. They had their own zeal and their own idea of what the faith should be. And the others from Cyrene, that is modern day Libya, um, Alexandria, that's modern day Egypt. So these others are from North Africa. So note, they're all from out of town. Uh, the Palestinians who are local either have made up their mind or they're being won over by the thousands, by the apostles, including temple Levites, as we, as we just talked about. These guys have their own schools of theology. Uh, even later in Christianity, if you study Christianity in the first two or three centuries, they will, they will identify five major locations, schools of thought that were influential to Christianity. They were Alexandria, Egypt. So Alexandria continues to be a place where great saints came from. Um, Jerusalem, Antioch, where we were first called Christians. Rome, because of Peter and Paul. And the other one is Constantinople, which is today Istanbul, Turkey. Those are the five big centers. And at Constantinople kind of associated with St. Andrew. That's where he, he went. Um, so these guys are I suppose they might be the Jewish equivalent of Apollos. If you read Vinny Mass a few, a few days back, a reading of Apollos came up, and Apollos is described as a guy who, you know, he was teaching correctly, correctly with accuracy about Scripture, with zeal, with eloquence, and he seemed to be a man of great charisma and character, a holy man, but he had only ever heard of the Baptist from John the Baptist. So he was, he was working with... John the Baptist's message, and uh, Achilla and Priscilla took him aside and introduced him to Paul and said, we'd like to update your knowledge. <laughs> Three and a half years of Jesus' in public ministry, I think you might want to hear about it. The one John the Baptist was promising would come, he already came, and so they update him, and once he feels updated, he takes off again to another town. Um, I think these guys who are debating Stephen are kind of like that from a Jewish perspective. <laughs> They have a maybe not up to date understanding of Judaism or a, a slightly narrower focus of teaching, um, and they're taking issue with this new movement that's taking place. That's I think all I can say about those guys. But they couldn't withstand. Him. So I don't know if you've ever known anybody in your life that's frustrated to you, that holds your opposite opinion, but they always win in a debate. How frustrated would that be? Because it said no one could withstand it. So they're, they're trying to find their best speakers, their best thinkers, and I'm sure, much like Jesus, try to set a trap for him, try to, try to set up things that will trip him up, and he withstands everything. He has this great knowledge of Scripture, and filled with the Spirit, he, he's always provided the right words. They, they ultimately come to the point where people tend to come to, which is, well, if we can't beat him, we have to silence him, which is happening in our country, I pointed out. Anyway, um, He's brought before the Sanhedrin. I won't, I won't read it all because, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if it's a speech that would sway me. Maybe it does sway you, but I'm not sure that it does me. Um, but he basically, they ask him, is that what you're teaching? Is that accurate, what these guys are accusing you of? And he chooses to just recount salvation history. He starts from Abraham. He goes through Joseph and the coat of many colors, reminding him how... Jews got to Egypt, and then how Moses led them out, and then Joshua leads them into the Holy Land, and then David and Solomon. Um, to me, none of that's objectionable. I can just hear the Sanhedrin and say, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, and what's the catch? And then all of a sudden, without support, I mean, he could have, he really could have done a lot of uh, specific quotes with this, but he just reaches the end and he says, you guys are always on the wrong side of history. Just like in every age, there were people who rejected the prophets. Here also, 
on the wrong side, the end. So he basically tells them they're confused and they're in the wrong, and like their forefathers, they miss the message of God. And now they're mad at him, just like the people in the temple area were mad when they decided to put him to death right on the spot. The only other thing I would add to this is in doing this, they broke the law. They, as I said this morning in Mass, um, because of abuses of power, the ability for the Sanhedrin to carry out a capital punishment was taken from them by the Romans. Um, it's a complicated history, but Herod the Great, I would really recommend, I say this every year, I don't, I don't know that anyone ever takes me up on it, but I think it's volume three of Josephus. There's an ancient Jewish historian, and um, he was given the task as a theologian to become a general in a holy war. He knew nothing about military practices or strategy or procedures, but they were convinced, these zealots, um, that God would see them to victory, and it was a holy war, so they didn't need military strategies, they just needed holy men of prayer, and God would tell them what to do, and so they assigned a general to each of the tribal areas, and since Galilee, that area to the north was the first to be hit when the Romans came in force, uh, they were wiped out. They, I think they lost the entire territory in three days. They just got steamrolled by, by the weaponry and the, the tactics of the Roman Empire. They, not, they didn't know what was hitting them. And uh, he, was, he was caught as a prisoner of war through a very providential thing. He was running away, and there's a lot of caves in there. He fell into a hole, basically. But he found there was like 20 or 30 other people in this hole. Um, and they decided to make a suicide pact, talking among themselves. We won't be taken alive, so we'll, we'll cast lots. And uh, the way we'll do it is that because no one wants to take their own life, they would consider that an unforgivable sin or whatever. That, uh, you know, number 29, you killed number 30. Number 28, you killed number 29. And then it's unlucky if you're number one. You get down to the last guy, you have to kill yourself. One person has to do that. And uh, Josephus was like the second or third in the, in the lot. In the lot. And when it gets down to three people, he says, let's talk this over. <laughs> <laughs> I think we shouldn't kill each other. Um, anyway, he talks himself out, out of getting down in, but he's captured. And they find out later he's the, supposed to be the head of the resistance. And that he's an educated scholar. So they forced him to write a history of the Jewish people. That's how his history got written. They say, we know some stuff about you, but you know, in our Roman libraries, we'd like to know all the history of the people we conquer. It might add prestige to us if we know who you guys are. So he, he writes it. So you're hearing the history of the Jewish people from someone from that era. And in particular, it's very fascinating. He writes about Herod the Great. And he said, um, you know, Herod the Great was a, was a Moabite. He was not a Semite. He wasn't a Jew. But he was friends with Augustus Caesar as a child. He was raised in Rome. And he thought, hey, this is my chance to have some power here. I want to convince the people that I am the fulfillment of all the prophecies of the Messiah. So he was very fascinated to know Jewish scripture. He tried to apply them to himself to see if people would accept him. And uh, so he, it, it kind of was a performance he put on just to try and seem Jewish. But there was a saying among the Jewish people, um, they weren't sure whether it was safer to be one of Herod's children or a pig <laughs> around him. Because, in other words, it was like a double insult that he didn't keep kosher at all. He ate pork. But he also killed a lot of his own children um, who he thought were plotting against him. He was very paranoid. And he murdered a bunch of them. But in the end, he left his kingdom to his three favorite sons. Um, his most favorite, he gave a double portion, which were the two southern territories of what we would call Israel today. And then uh, the 
two upper areas he gave to two other sons, and he gave little cities to one of his daughters. Anyway, the guy who was given the territory in Jerusalem was such a hot-headed, violent, uh, unmanageable piece of work that Rome had to set Pontius Pilate and just say, this guy, I can't work with him. He's totally unstable. He's causing problems all the time. Pontius Pilate, when he went there, was given one job. We don't like riots. Make sure riots don't happen. I don't care about the stuff. Just keep it stable. Um, that's when they lost their ability to stand eager to circle back to the point. When they lost some of their powers. We just say, we're stripping this away from you because you guys have not been playing nice with the Roman Empire. Um, so for them to order someone to stone to death is a direct violation of Roman law. Okay. Anyway, um, that's the speech that he gives. And then ultimately, we get this grand introduction of another big character at the end. It says that uh, not only they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth against him. <laughs> but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together upon him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. I was about to point to someone whose phone it wasn't in church. Heresy. So. They're standing there going, they don't want to listen. They can just see them like a temper tantrum, dancing on their, their feet. Uh, they, they lead him out. Uh, they have him stoned to death. They cast him out of the, the city to be stoned. And the witnesses lay down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Why are they laying down their garments? Because the garments are bulky and they want a good wind up. So they can throw them hard. Um, the stoning that they still do today, by the way, in the Middle East, involves sometimes dropping somebody in a hole so they're like buried up to their neck so they can't, can't even flinch or move or cover your head, or protect yourself, and just throw stones until they're dead. Um, but the, the guy who was gathering the ropes, it says, uh, is a man named Saul. Ta-da! Next big figure enters in. So we saw that the Barnabas, one of those guys who made everything and named Barnabas, and now here his partner enters the scene, but in a pretty sinister way. He will probably say, I'm innocent, I did not throw any rock. But you you certainly endorsed it, and you had a front row seat, and you didn't try to stop it. Um, and as they were stoning Steve, so in the midst of him being stoned, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's a little anachronistic way of saying died. So sometimes when you see falling asleep, it really means passing away. Okay, that's what we conclude today. Any, any comments or thoughts? Yeah, um, can I read the speech that Stephen gave? Yeah. Maybe I'm reading it to it a little too much, but um, something I get from it is that what he's saying is, because he's talking about Abraham, how God told him to move and you know, forget whatever God from Mesopotamia and follow him to where the place he's going to give him, is that Abraham changed, because you know, they're, they're charging him with changing Moses' laws and trying to destroy these things. Was that Abraham you know, changing against God? Or when Moses, you know, the burning bush, or when he went to the uh, mountain to meet God, was that him changing what already was? I feel like he's, what he's saying is stories, you know, with Joseph and David, he's giving stories of not changing, but God's evolving covenant and the fulfillment of God's covenant, which ultimately ends in Jesus. So he's saying against these charges, we're not changing against God, we're building the full evolution of his covenant, 
through these stories, that's that sort of what I, I sort of read into him explaining is what I got from it. You swung me over. <laughs> I like it to say um, our faith doesn't mean never changing. It means being prepared to follow the Lord where he leads us. And maybe Stephen is saying, the Lord is now leading us again. And you're the people who always are behind and not being willing to be led. I like that. I think that's solid. That's a more optimistic reading too, so thank you for that. So, so I, I felt similar to that because I started with the feeling that Stephen said, you know, this is really important stuff here. Yeah. And, and I want you to understand that I didn't make this up and here's my references for how I got to here. And the big, big issue was you didn't trust, you didn't believe that God, when Jesus, when he said, I could destroy this temple and raise it up in three days, he was talking about God, he was talking about Jesus, not the man-made temple. And his reference there is that this man-made temple is just another idol. You gotta believe in God, not the temple, the message. Yeah. That's what I got from It's also good. <laughs> hey, I benefited from you guys today. That's a gift, a gift to me, I'll take it. Um, I, it's also possible to me in sharing this that he might have wanted to at least throw some seeds to say, you know, I'm not from planet Mars. I, I believe in the story of our salvation and history from our Jewish roots. I'm, I'm with you to there, but I'm here to give you a new chapter, uh, the next part. But we, we actually have common roots. I'm not from paganism. I'm, I'm a Jew. I'm from that, that system of belief. Um, maybe that's something that gets us sympathetic here to some people. What do you think about the change in attitude from looking on him and seeing the face of an angel and, and the next thing that's going on him do that? <laughs> the face of an angel. I, I think I've always just read that to mean he is innocent, like Jesus was innocent, was like us in all ways but sin. Here's a guy who's so innocent, it's, you can read it on his face. He's a holy man.
world of that. Amen. 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 And I want to God bless you this week in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Make sure to pick up the schedule.